Du'at scroll Chumash, it's on page 696. If you're in any other Chumash, it's chapter 25 of the book of uh, Leviticus, by Yikra. So here we begin Bahar, and there's actually a verse in the Torah portion of Bahar that uh, is quite famous. And it's on the Liberty Bell. It says, proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. It's taken right out of this week's Torah portion in the discussion of the Jubilee year. So the Torah tells us that there's something called Shemitah, the seventh year, which we know is the sabbatical year. And even in the English uh, vernacular, people know what a sabbatical is. It's a period of time that you take off from your mundane routine occupation. It doesn't have to be a whole year. Sometimes people take a sabbatical for half a year or whatever period of time. But the idea is you're getting a rest. You're getting a respite to just like Shabbat, which is the seventh day of the week. It gives you time to uh, not just rest, but rejuvenate and focus on the past week and the coming week and be able to connect spiritually on a higher plane. That's why we go to shul, to daven, to learn to feed our soul, not just our bodily uh, material needs. So to, just like you do that once a week, every seventh day, the Torah says there should be the sabbatical year, where the entire year is a year of rest. The farmer cannot work their land. And until today, there are farmers in Israel that don't work for the entire sabbatical year. Now, just that you know that when Israel was established, some of the great rabbis found a halachic loophole, so to speak, to work in the seventh year. And they did that by saying, you can't work your land, but if we lease it out or sell it to an Arab for the year, we could do work for the Arab and have some kind of financial arrangement. Now, the reason why some rabbis were lenient and allowed that was because they said the country is a new country and it can't survive if it doesn't have the agricultural produce uh at this early stage but be that as it may whatever halachic position you take the fact is there are many farmers that don't work these days because they said oh back then maybe there was a permissibility a halachic heter given but hey we should make the land rest but the idea of sabbatical is that it doesn't matter if you're a farmer or any profession uh if you're able to take some time off periodically once in seven years, sometimes people do it once in 10 years or in 15 years. We're like, let's spend it a year to like really focus on my growth, on my connection to God, my spirituality, my relationship with Hashem, and so on and so forth. And my family, of course, and so on. So that's the sabbatical year. Now, just that you know, we'll get into it as time goes, there's a major benefit to the sabbatical year, and that has to do with creating equity. Um, to provide a, a great deal of the Torah portion deals with the poor and how to uh, provide for those who are financially disadvantaged. And one of the benefits of the sabbatical year is that in the sabbatical year, the fields become ownerless, which means anyone is allowed to go into the field and take and collect whatever they want from it. So it's a way of providing provisions, just like there are laws of charity and agricultural charity, the corn of the fields, the farmer has to leave, what he uh, what he drops, he has to leave, what he forgot, he has to leave. There's ways of providing in the other six years. In the seventh year, the field is completely open for anyone to come and take whatever grows. So that's the societal uh, benefit of the sabbatical year, plus the personal benefit of the person getting a year off. Just want to remind you, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, please feel free to share it in the comment box. But then the Torah goes on to say further, not only should you count six years to the seventh year, which should be the sabbatical year, you should count seven cycles of seven. We keep on coming back to the number seven, which of course is Shabbat, the holiest day. And the seven sabbatical years lead us to the Jubilee year, which is in the 50th year. We know the Jubilee is the 50th year celebration, and in English we call it Jubilee because it's a year of celebration, but actually what it was in biblical times, it was a year of freedom. And therefore, the Liberty Bell says, 
that what the verse says in this week's Torah portion of the 50th year, you should sanctify the 50th year. It's a holy year. And then it says, it's interesting, on the Liberty Bell, they didn't write, you shall sanctify the 50th year. They only continued the verse after that and said, and proclaim freedom throughout the land for all its inhabitants. Why is it a year of freedom? And the answer is that in the ancient biblical times, a person could become a servant. And I choose the word servant rather than a slave, because when we think about slavery, we think of people uh, physically abusing slaves and taking advantage of them. As you know, that the Torah's laws of slavery are like servitude. Why? Because the Torah says, the Talmud says, if you acquire a servant, you really acquire a master. Because there's so many rules. You can't eat before your servant eats dinner or lunch or breakfast. You have to serve him before you serve yourself. If there's one bed in the house, you have to give it to your servant. The master cannot sleep on it. If there's one pillow, the servant gets it, right? Of course, you can never strike or hit your servant. So let's say a person was poor, destitute, and they couldn't make it on their own. And, uh, you know, some people can, can't... Uh, can survive, they don't have the ability to earn a living. So what happens in our society? You could become a, a homeless, God forbid. But in the biblical society, you would be acquired by someone who would take you into their home, take care of all your needs, but you would be subservient to them. But take, for example, Shabbat. Your servants have to rest on Shabbat, just like you have to rest. They can't work seven days a week. There's a lot of laws. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, if you walk into a Jewish home, and there's one match, uh, indentured servant, exactly. Um, if you walk into a, a, a Jewish home and there's one bed, and you see one person on the bed and one person on the floor next to the bed or somewhere in the room, and I say to you, one's the master, one's the servant. In a normal home, non-Jewish, you say, well, of course, the master is in his bed and the servant is on the floor. But in the Jewish home, on the Jewish law, it would be the servant in the bed and the master on the floor. So... If a person was unable to earn a living for whatever reason, they would become a servant. In the seventh year, they have to go free. That's one of the laws of the sabbatical year. If the servant says, I love it here, this is the best lifestyle, you know? And there are a lot of people, and uh, successful people, who hire live-in nannies or live-in chefs or live-in uh, housekeepers. And they say, this is great. I live in this beautiful big home. I have all the food I need in the refrigerator. I have a good life here. You know, I have my own quarters. I get to the day off. It's much better than having to fend for myself in some other situation. But there's another way a person could become a servant or an indentured servitude. And that is if, God forbid, they committed a crime and they stole. Now, the law is when somebody steals, the penalty is they have to repay the debt plus double payment. Pay full. So the guy stole, let's say, $5,000. He has to pay $10,000. Now, what's if he doesn't have the money to pay? So again, in our society, the guy's thrown in jail. Now, jail may be good or not good. I don't know if it's going to rehabilitate the person. He may come out and be a thief again. But one thing is for sure, when you throw somebody into slavery, I'm sorry, when you throw someone into prison, that doesn't help the owner get back their money. They're still out of the money that was stolen, and they surely don't get the double compensation. So the Torah has a much better remedy. The Torah says, take this person and sell them as a servant, as a slave, as an indentured servitude, and take the money from his sale and give it to the person who is the victim of the crime. So that, first of all, they will get back their loss. That's number one. But more than that, why did somebody steal? Maybe they're lazy. Maybe they're, they don't have a good work ethic, so they rely on, on theft. But now that they will have to be in the years of slavery, they will learn a good work ethic. They will get really rehabilitated. They'll see the benefits of hard work. They'll see the, the feeling of self-esteem you get from good work. They'll see their master success, and they'll want it for themselves. And when they go out, they will pursue that lifestyle of being an honest, hardworking individual rather than a thief. Now, I want to point out that, um, what did I want to point out? I wanted to point out that there is a mitzvah in this week's Torah portion for the family members to redeem the person. So even though I, I purchased, I acquired a servant or a slave or an indentured servitude, 
if a relative comes along and says, okay, my uh, my relative had to sell himself because of either he stole, he couldn't pay back, or because he couldn't sustain himself, but I want to redeem him, the master must release him if he takes the money. So let's say he bought him for six years for $6,000, for example, and in year three, the guy comes along and says, I want to redeem my brother, my cousin, my, my son, parents, whatever it is. They could give $3,000 for the remaining three years and take him back. And the owner cannot object to that. Um, so that's a mitzvah of to redeem the person. I mentioned before, I don't know if I completed the thought. Sometimes life was so good that a person said, I don't want to go free. It's the seventh year. Go free. I don't want to go free. And the Torah says he could stay on, but you have to pierce his ear. Now, what is that all about? So the idea is that the Torah does not want a person to be a slave or a servant even, an indentured servant to another human being, because the Torah says, you are my servants. God says, you are in my servitude, not subjected to being subjugated to the servitude of another human being. No human being should be in the uh, subjugated to another human being. We should be in the service of God, no, no matter how well your boss treats you or your master treats you. So ideally, we want to only serve God. We want freedom. But if a person says, I really like this lifestyle, so we pierce his ear. Why? Because the rabbis say, this ear that heard at Mount Sinai, God say, the Jewish people are my servants. And this person is willfully choosing a master. In the beginning, he didn't willfully do it. Maybe he stole, he had no choice. He was sold. Or maybe he had no money. He had to sell himself to, make, to, to eat, to survive, because he was destitute and poverty-stricken. But now he's willfully saying, I like this. I want to stay subservient to another human being. This is a violation of God's command. You are my servant. So he pierces the to say that he wasn't listening properly at Mount Sinai. It's a sign of shame. However, when the 50th year comes along, the Jubilee year, everyone has to go free. And that's one of the reasons the Torah says on the Yom Kippur of the 50th year, you should blow, blow the shofar. The, the, the bet then counts 50 years. 50th year, the shofar is blown, and all the servants are set free. And not only the servants, and this is very interesting, you know, today you buy real estate, it's yours. But there are situations, could be in Israel, but I know even here in America, I once heard that Breakers Row, when people buy condominiums in Breakers Row, I've heard that it's a long-term 99-year lease. Um, they do not own it permanently. It belongs to the Breakers Hotel. They just get a long-term lease. Well, in the biblical times, uh, land in Israel was only a long-term lease for 49 years. In the 50th year, it reverted back to the original families. When the Jewish people came to the land of Israel, the land was divided by the families, by the tribes of Israel. So every tribe got their portion in the land of Israel. Now, if a family became destitute and they had to sell their land, and now they were poverty stricken, what happens to that family? So we know that sometimes the cycle of poverty can be perpetuated forever and ever. And how do you break that cycle of poverty in the family? So the Torah says, let's say your father or your grandfather, let's say, God forbid, was poor and had to sell his land. Does that mean your family never has land again to be self-reliant, self-sufficient, and earn a living with your produce? And the answer is no. The Torah gives a way to give it back to you. In the 50th year, all the land goes back to their original owner. So that's the jubilee year, the year of freedom. You may say, well, it may be freedom for the servants. It may be freedom for the landowners who get back their land. But what about me? Um, I acquired all this land, now I got to relinquish it. I acquired these servants, and now I have to surrender all these servants. And that's why the shofar is blown. The shofar is blown for two reasons. First of all, to the Talmud says, you know, the reason the, the shofar is blown is that you know you're not the only one who is letting go of their servants and their land. Everyone has to do this. So when you know everyone's doing the same thing, it makes it more tolerable, more easy. As the Talmud says, uh, the, 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 the challenges of, of the many is the comfort, a uh, comfort into itself, right? So you people go to support groups. Why? Because I'm not alone. I have other people going through this with me. So the chauffeur blast tells them 
Everyone is going through this, not just you. So don't feel bad that you have to let go of your land or your servants that you amassed and acquired and accumulated. But why on Yom Kippur? Usually you blow the shofar on Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the first day of the 50th year. Why on the 10th day of Yom Kippur is the shofar blown? Why the 10th day of Yom Kippur? It's 10 days into the year. It should have been done on day one of the 50th year. And one of the explanations of Yom Kippur is the day of of repentance. Obviously, Yom Kippurim means the day of atonement. But it's also a day of spiritual elevation where we focus on our soul rather than our bodies. We focus on our spiritual identity, our neshama. And that's why the relinquishing of the servants is on Yom Kippur with the shofar blast. Because what it's teaching us is as follows. You see, True freedom can only be acquired when you grant other people their freedom. If you're holding on to someone's land or to someone else's body as a servant of yours, so to speak, even within the regulations of the Torah, you're not truly free. If you have the need to control another person, to diminish another person, because at the end of the day, they're being diminished, they're servant to a servant rather than to God, then it represents a lack of your true freedom. Because if you were truly free, you would let them go. You would set them free. You wouldn't have a need to possess other people's land or control other people's lives in order to feel free. So psychologically, or superficially, I should say, you may feel free. Oh, I have all this land, I have all these servants, I feel powerful, I feel important. But if you were truly free, you wouldn't need to subjugate other people to make yourself feel more validated or more important or more powerful. So on a spiritual level, it's precisely not just freedom for the servants, but it's freedom for the masters. You know, if you think very physically, right, if you have to hold on to somebody to arrest them, to subdue them, you may be controlling them. But you are also being arrested and subdued in that moment because you have to be holding on and controlling that person. And I think there's a psychological truth to this, that people have a need to control other people rather than grant them their free will and their free choice. People have a need to manipulate other people. It shows a lack of true inner freedom because if you are truly free, you wouldn't need to manipulate others to do what you want. You would be comfortable and satisfied with yourself without having to feel that you're dominating or controlling another person. A person who needs to dominate others and control others is usually, on the outside, maybe they appear strong and mighty, but on the inside, they're usually insecure and weak. And that's why they have to, you know, if somebody's having a discussion with you and they start shouting you down and getting angry, right, to control your opinion, they're not really free. If they're really free in their thoughts and in their feelings and in their opinions, they would make room for your opinion, and it doesn't hurt their identity or their value that someone disagrees with them. I love the line, my man, and he says, just like no two people look the same, no two people think the same. And the Kotsky Rebbe says, what's the connection? You know, ain't those same Shabbos. People don't have the same thought patterns and beliefs and ideologies and opinions and philosophies. Okay, but why does he compare it to just like no two people look the same, so too they don't necessarily think the same. And he, the Kaskarabi says a beautiful answer. He says that if you see someone like we all do that doesn't look like you, right? Does it ever upset you and say, hey, why don't you look like me? How dare you look different than me? On the contrary, you're happy. You want to be you, and I want you to be you. I don't want you to look like me. On the contrary, I want to be myself. I want to be unique. And I don't have a problem if I'm in a room with 20 people and they all look different than me. I don't expect them to look like me. And I don't want them necessarily to look like me. I want them to look like themselves. So my man, and he says, just like people's thoughts are not the same, so just like their faces are not the same, so too their thoughts are not the same which means, A, everyone is unique, everyone is different. But furthermore, don't resent somebody for not thinking like you. Don't get upset that somebody disagrees with you. On the contrary, they are they and you are you. They look like themselves. And it's not just the external appearance. You know, our external self is a reflection of our inner self. So therefore, what it's saying is the fact that people look different is because God is telling us 
that just like on the outside you're different, on the inside you're different. No two people think alike and feel alike. That's why we say in the Shemona Esther, when we finish the Amidah, we say, Almighty God, may you rebuild the Holy Temple and give us our portion in your Torah. Which means no one could uncover and discover and reveal your unique perspective of Torah. Everyone has their own particular brain uh, wave length that only they could there's a piece of the Torah that's waiting for you to uh, reveal in this world because nobody is you. As someone said, be yourself because everyone else is taken. So that is the message of um, freedom for freedom for, throughout the land for all the inhabitants. What do you mean all the inhabitants? Only the slaves that are going free. It's only the landowners that are getting back their freedom and their land. Because now they're in financial uh, subjugation. They don't have their own land. They're reliant on charity. Now they get their freedom back. No, even the ones who relinquish the land and relinquish the servants, they too are gaining their freedom in this process. Now, I just want to point out that while we have Shabbat every seven days, we have Shemitah every seventh year, and we have Jubilee year every 50th year. And by the way, even if you don't live in Israel, you have to be careful in the sabbatical year because you're not allowed to eat the fruit of eighth year from land that was harvested in the seventh year. So you have to, and there's a special supervision that says this is not in violation of the laws of Shemitah in Israel especially, but even if in America, if you get fruit from Israel. But going back to um, the, uh, the discussion of Shabbat versus Shemitah and the Jubilee year, the seventh year is also called Shabbat. It says when you come to the land of Israel, the land shall rest a Shabbat to God. Six years you shall work your land and improve your vineyard and gather your crop. And on the seventh year should be a Shabbat Shabbaton. So the same terminology of Shabbat is used in conjunction with the sabbatical year like Shabbat. And the same thing with the Jubilee. As I told you, the Liberty Bell says proclaim freedom about the land, but the opening verse is, and you shall sanctify the 50th year. So there's an idea of holiness and sanctity. But there is a major difference. And the difference is that on Shabbat, we're not allowed to engage in any material activities. Okay? So Shabbat is a complete day of rest. We can't work at all. Torah says six days you should work, but you should rest on Shabbat. On, as opposed to the sabbatical year and the jubilee year, which is very different. Why is it different? It's different because in those years, you're allowed to work. You're not allowed to work your field. But it's not like Shabbat, they have to stay home and rest all day. You could go do many other activities. Now, you may think that's a disadvantage, right? Because it's not as holy as Shabbat. But a rabbi says it's actually holier. Why? Because the whole idea in Judaism of holiness is to bring the holiness into the mundane world, to elevate the physical world, not to detach yourself from the world. Shabbat, you detach yourself from the physical world. Yeah, you still eat and drink and sleep, but you don't engage in any commerce, mundane activities. You don't turn on your computer. You don't turn on your phone. You don't do any of that. It's a holy day, completely holy to God, completely spiritual. But the seventh year and the jubilee year is not that way. Those are years that you can engage in the physical activities. You just can't work your field. So you have more time for spiritual pursuits. But you're combining your spiritual pursuits with the material world. And that's the ultimate goal of Judaism, to connect heaven and earth. Now, I just want to point out that there is a very clear parallel between the Jubilee year and the holiday of Shavuot. We know we're just three weeks away from the holiday of Shavuot. And the holiday of Shavuot, it comes after 49 days of counting, seven cycles of seven, the Torah says. Counts seven weeks, and the 50th day is Shavuot. And here we say the same thing, just in terms of years. Count seven cycles of seven years, seven Shemitot, and you get to the Yovel. So there's a lot of similarities in this counting. And 
I just want to point out that the word used for the counting of the Omer, it says, count seven weeks, Sheva Shabbatot Timimot, complete years, or complete days, or 49 complete days to get to the 50th day. And here we, in this, so it's possible we also find the word to mimot, shana tvima, a whole year, and so on and so forth. So what does the word complete mean? And I'm reminded of the joke that there was a uh, an English contest, and they asked the audience, what's the difference between finished and complete? Or is there a difference between the word complete and finished? And the winning answer was, people gave different answers. Uh, I'm sure if I ask you, maybe you'll have some answers to the distinguish between the word finished and complete. The winning answer was, if you marry the right person, you're complete. But if you marry the wrong person, you're finished. And while that is a joke, the message I think is as finished. There's, well, there's two levels of completeness. There's finished, I finished the job. And then there's I completed the job. And I think the truth is, that the word to me, oh, it doesn't mean finished. It means completed. You see, when something is complete, you know, there's something where this, there's an idea that sometimes the sum is greater than the parts, right? I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. I accidentally got off the Zoom and got back on. So when you say something is complete, it means that the, the sum is greater than the parts. In other words, a complete person, for example, right, is somebody who all the parts complement, all his characteristics complement one another, to make them even better than all the individual parts combined. There's an additional completeness that comes. So a year has 365 days, let's say, on the English calendar, or 354 on the lunar Jewish calendar, right? That's, you finish the year, right? You go through the, the, the calendar, you finish this year, you throw out the calendar. You're finished with this year's calendar, right? Finished means I just, I finished it. Completed means there's a sense of completion, and when you celebrate the completion of a tractate of Talmud, for example, right? It's not just that you read all the pages. It's that you have attained a new level of Torah depth or understanding. You, can, you complete a project. It's more than just finish the project. It's the parts that are undefinable. And that's what I think the Torah is saying is that when you count the Omer, you get to Shavuot. After all the days of preparation and self-perfection, you come to a place, and the same thing is with the sabbatical years and the Shabbat and the Jubilee year. By having these periods of holiness within the cycle of the years, you complete the years. You make the years more perfect, so to speak. Um, so just that idea of Tamimot, which is part of this week's Torah portion. Um, once we're on the topic of Shemitah, the Torah portion also talks about the um, poor person. And there's a very interesting commandment in this week's Torah portion. Everyone knows the mitzvah of tzedakah. It's most probably one of the most universally renowned mitzvah. Charity, tzedakah, charity. But believe it or not, there is a higher mitzvah than tzedakah. And what is it? 
So let me read to you the verse in chapter 25. It says, If your brother becomes impoverished, destitute, and his hand becomes, his means falter, his hand becomes weak, in your midst, he's living amongst you, and you see he's becoming weakened, he's becoming impoverished. What does the Torah say? You shall strengthen him. But what exactly does this mean? Does it mean you should give him charity? Well, that's tzedakah. What is this verse teaching us? So Rashi, on the, this verse, chapter uh, 25, verse 35, if you want to see it inside, says that what this verse is talking about is before a person becomes poor. And here's the analogy that Rashi quotes from the Midrash. He says, if you have a donkey that's laden with the uh, burdens, with merchandise, with the uh, bags, packages, right? And the donkey collapses. So Rashi says, based on the Midrash, that it would take five people to lift the donkey back up with the packages. However, what happens when the donkey starts shaking, when the donkey starts uh, wavering and becoming unstable? One person could just put up his hands and support the donkey and prevent it from collapsing. So what's going to take five people, once the donkey is already on the ground, only takes one person when the donkey is still standing, but starting to falter, starting to uh, shake a little bit, starting to become a little insecure. And that's an analogy for so many areas of life. You know, take a kid who's having trouble in school in third grade, let's say, right? If somebody addresses his issues, why he's struggling in third grade, you know, it may take an extra hour of tutoring uh, once a week, a little counseling, a little, and the kid could go on an amazingly positive path. But if this kid is allowed to continue to falter and struggle, it could lead to a life of God knows what, crime, drugs, uh, who knows where this kid could end up, right? And then when you want to rehabilitate the kid after he, the kid becomes uh you know, in, involved in crime or drugs or other bad behaviors, it could take so much more time, effort, expense, energy to rehabilitate the person. So the wise person, that it's like anything, take an illness, God forbid, a person has a minor problem, he could cure it easily. But if it's allowed to grow and become a bigger problem, right? Now, God forbid, the cure and the rehab could be so much more difficult. And that's what the Torah is saying with poverty. Don't wait for a person to become destitute, file for bankruptcy, uh, have the bank foreclose on their house and become homeless. Now you got to rebuild this whole person, right? And by the way, the Shemitah year is, one of the laws of the sabbatical year is that it relinquishes all debts. If someone loaned money in the seventh year, it becomes relinquished, unless they go to the court and insist on holding on to the debt. There's a way to do that called the Prus bill that the Hilo instituted. But ideally, the message is, okay, this guy had seven years to pay his debt. He's not able to. Wipe the books clean. Give him a break. You know, Forgive the loan. Let him start afresh. And the ideas of bankruptcy is based on this, that a person sometimes needs to get uh, redemption from his debts so he could start again. But they, all of these laws have, have to do with creating you know, on the one hand, Judaism believes in freedom, free enterprise, capitalism. Everyone should have a right to work hard and become successful. On the other hand, the Torah believes that we have to have equity and we have to um, this, you help the poor and look out for them. And one of the ways is when you see a person faltering, help him out before he collapses. And we all know that Maimonides says there's eight levels of charity and the highest level is not even charity. You know what it is? It is literally giving somebody a loan. It doesn't cost you anything. It doesn't cost you anything. That's why every Jewish community has free loan societies. Gemilat Chesed. And individuals give loans. Or you can give money to the fund. 
you get your money back. You say to the Gemil al Chasid, here's five thousand dollars, you can lend it out to people. And I'm gonna give it to you for five years or ten years. And your money is loaned to people repeatedly. I have to tell you, I just had a very positive experience. I'm gonna put this out here for everyone to know. Because maybe other people might you may know someone who needs this, right? But our local Jewish Federation, shout out to our local Jewish Federation. I once heard that they have a free loan society. So a person came to me and he needed help. Wonderful person, honest person, a hardworking person, but situation and you know, he has a family to support, and it wasn't, you know, he's going through some hard times. Certain economies, certain businesses are struggling these days, and he needed some help. So obviously I did what I can do. And, you know, I've, I've helped him in the past, but it wasn't, I knew he needed more. So I said, you know, I think there's a free loan society at the Federation. Let me look into it. And sure enough, I did. And you should know this, if you know someone that needs it, they have a wonderful, wonderful system. So basically, they're willing to lend somebody, and this is what this person was able to get, forty. $800, which is a sizable amount of money. If somebody is behind on their rent or something, $4,800, that's beautiful, right? And the first three months, they don't have to start paying. They get a 90-day uh, delay. And then after three months, all they have to pay is $100 a month for 48 months. Okay, so that's basically uh, four years, right? They get three months, no payment, and then Four years to pay back $100 a month, which is a very doable type of a way to pay back a loan. Now, they do ask for a co-signer, which I was happy to co-sign for this person because, you know, okay, if he, if he misses a payment one month, uh, it's $100, you know, it's it's very doable, right? So it's pretty easy to get a co-signer for that kind. Of, if it was a, you know, three-month loan for $5,000, well, if the guy doesn't pay, I have to pay $5,000, but $100 a month is not terrible, Right. So it's easy for the person to pay back, easy for the co-signer to help out. And it's a wonderful way, you know. So, you know, the Torah in this week's parsha actually says, do not charge interest. <clears throat> if a poor man needs money and you have money sitting in your bank account, excess money that you don't need right now, it's a mitzvah to loan it to the person. And it's the highest form of charity, my man. And he says, why is it the highest form of charity? Even though you're not giving away anything, you're getting all your money back. But the reason it's the highest form of charity is because you see, a poor man, we usually think that what is the poor man lacking? We usually think he's lacking money because that's obvious he's lacking money, right? But the truth is, a poor person is not only lacking money. What else are they lacking? Self-esteem, dignity, honor. It's a terrible thing to not be able to be self-sufficient and self-reliant and have to turn to other people for charity and be dependent on other people. It's a humiliating feeling. It's terrible, God forbid, right? So therefore, the Torah says, how could you help him financially without injuring his self-esteem and dignity? And the best way to do that is with a loan or a job, by the way. If you could give someone a, 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 a job so they could earn an income, or if you could give someone a loan so they don't need to feel like they took charity, you know, in the, in the, in the Birkat Amazon, grace after meals, one of the things we say is, please, God, do not make us needy or dependent. Hashem Lokein, Lord our God, lowly de matan batar badam. We should never be dependent on the gifts of human beings of flesh and blood. And then we say, velo de alvasam. And not their loans either. But rather, we only want to get it from your hand, which is full, malaya, rechava, wide, holy, open. Then we say, why? We should never be embarrassed. And never be embarrassed. So, again, if you earn a living and you're self-sufficient, it's a tremendous blessing in life. But always be empathetic to the people who aren't so fortunate. And therefore, strengthen them. You know, guys, business is struggling. Maybe they're going through a hard time with a little bit of help, a little bit of a loan, or maybe drive a little business today. I'm going to tell you one of those beautiful stories I once heard. 
there was a phone and I think, I don't know where it happened in America or in Israel, but it doesn't matter really. A woman was planning a bar mitzvah for her son. So she called a friend of ours who maybe knew of different musicians and said, uh, could you recommend? I'm looking for a keyboard player for my son's uh, bar mitzvah. So she said, I actually have two different people I can recommend. He gave two names and two numbers. So the woman says, okay, thank you. Now, what would most people ask? The natural question is, who's better? Or who's more affordable? Right? That's the, the way most people think, right? If someone gave you two recommendations, you want to know who's better performer and who's a better price. This is what the woman said. Who needs the livelihood more? Such a beautiful way to think. You know, tomorrow you need to do business with somebody. You need a air conditioning repairman. You need a contract or whatever, right? One guy maybe is doing very well. He doesn't need the business. This other guy, maybe he needs a little strengthening. You could do this mitzvah, right? Strengthen him, give him some business, give him a job, give him a loan, do something. And then his, his donkey doesn't have to collapse because once he falls into poverty, God forbid, and becomes destitute or becomes evicted from his home or loses whatever he loses, oh, it's five times at least harder to rebuild that person again. So that's the unique mitzvah of the Hechazaktabo. And then the verse ends with a very beautiful line. It says, imach, He should live with you. What does it mean he should live with you? He should go on living. He should not have to fall. He should not have to falter. He should not have to leave the Jewish community. Just like you want to live and you want to prosper and you want to be happy and you want to be successful. That's the same thing you should want for the next person. And you should help every member of the community achieve that blessing. I want to tell you something very beautiful. We have a program at the synagogue called the Solomon Leadership Program, and it's been very successful, thank God, and we opened up a lot of other chapters. We have like eight other chapters. So there was a graduation in Sunny Isle, um, Florida, one of the communities down there who ran this leadership program for high school kids. So I went down to the graduation with Sarah Dworkin, who's the executive director of the program, and so on. So the graduation has a commencement speech. And who did they invite? They invited the mayor of Sunny Isles. And she was talking to the teens about leadership and why she became a leader, a mayor of the city. And she told her story. She was a Jewish woman. And she said when she came to America, she was a little girl, five years old. And she said she remembers till today how when they came, they had nothing. And the Jewish community took them in and the Jewish Federation provided for them. And she said it was the first time coming from Russia that she experienced the blessing and the power of community. And she said ever since then, she knew she wanted to be a leader of a community to help give back to the community because she knows the importance of community. And that's why she became, you know, she got involved in politics and became the mayor of Sunny Isle. And she has the opportunity every day to help the community. And that's the idea of your brother should live with you, which means... We shouldn't just look out for ourselves. We shouldn't even just look out for our families. That's natural to only think about yourself or your family. We should look out for the whole community. There's a responsibility to care for others in the community, to make sure people don't fall into poverty, to strengthen them, to give them loans without interest. And that's a lot of the uh, commandments in this week's Torah portion all relating to helping to create a society that is fair and just, and looks out for the needs of all the members of the community. Um, I want to just focus on something else, and that is that God says, you know why you shouldn't be a servant to another person? Because you're my servants. God says, I took you out of Egypt, and I made you my servants. You're not a servant to human beings like the Pharaoh or anyone else. <clears throat> and therefore, ideally, a person should be free. And if under certain circumstances they're sold, they go out in the seventh year, if not the seventh, the jubilee year, and the family members could redeem them and so on and so forth. But I want to talk for a minute about this idea of we being the servants of God. You know, God took us out of Egypt. Seemingly, he wanted us to be free. But what did he do? He made us his servants. Well, if we're God's servants, we're still not free. 
we substituted servitude to Pharaoh to servitude to God. Now, maybe God's a more merciful, compassionate master, not like Pharaoh, who's a ruthless, uh, evil man. But at the end of the day, am I, I'm not, am I free to do what I want to do? No, I have to be a servant of God. I have to do what God wants me to do. So how do I gain freedom by taking the Torah at Mount Sinai? The whole thing on the 28th day of the counting of the Omer, we're making our way, we're four weeks into the 50th day, Shavuot, and big celebration, God gave us the Torah. The Torah is full of laws. You must do this, you must not do that, restrictions. How is this our freedom? Seemingly we're servants of God. <laughs> and I could give you a lot of analogies, okay? But let's use the difference between a police officer versus a army sergeant. You know, God forbid nobody wants to get arrested and taken by a policeman in a police car to jail. That's obviously a lack of your, your freedom is over, right? You lost your greatest blessing. But many people joined the army. There are many lone soldiers who go come from America to Israel. Now, when you go into the army, now you have to listen to the commands of your. You also gave up your freedom. Now you're in the army. You got to get up at five o'clock. You got to run this uh, exercise. Uh, do this. Do that. You're being told what to do for the next two years. Like, why would you willfully submit to a, be a soldier in an army? The policeman. Nobody wants to get arrested and go to jail. A lot of people want to go serve in the army. Why? especially the Israeli army, but even the American army. It's a voluntary army. Why do people do it? <clears throat> and the answer is that there's a twofold answer. The first answer is when you're serving in an army, yes, you have to follow rules. You you, you give up a certain amount of freedom when you're in the army. Your, your, your general or your sergeant will tell you what to do morning, afternoon, and evening. But it's for a higher purpose. And therefore, you're happy to give up your freedom to follow the directives of the sergeant because only by listening to him could you achieve that, that higher purpose. But furthermore, the policeman, God forbid, or the prison warden stifles you, suffocates you, kills you. you know, it's like you're dying a slow death, God forbid, in jail, right? Because you can't actualize your potential. You're locked up, God forbid. As opposed to a soldier... They're building his character. They're building his inner strength. They're building his courage. They're building his skills and making you a better version of yourself. But you could only do that by going through the discipline of being under the army rules, regulations, and protocols. And the same thing is true with the Torah. Does the Torah give us guidelines how to live? Yes. Does the Torah tell us what we're allowed to do and not allowed to do? Yes. But it's through these laws that we fulfill our higher purpose in this world, to be servants of God. And yes, we have to subjugate ourselves to the will of God, just like the soldier has to subjugate himself to the will of his master. When I say master, I mean his commander. And he even salutes his, ma his commander and his sergeant and his general, right? Why? Because he's grateful to him. Why? Because he's helping him actualize his potential. He's helping him fulfill his purpose and his higher calling. And he's developing who who he is as a human being. And that's what the Torah does. It makes us better versions of ourselves. It elevates us. It helps us fulfill our destiny and our purpose. <laughs> and we need these guidelines. You know, everyone wants to be free. But without discipline and rules, nothing productive can happen, right? If you want to write, if you want to play beautiful music, you want to be a great composer, a great musician, and play the most beautiful music in the world. That's the most inspiring. There's rules to music. There's a discipline. There's a certain amount of keys on the piano or string chords in the, on the guitar. And you have to really perfect your performance with a lot of training and a lot of hard work. And then something beautiful comes out. Even if you take the strings of a violin, right? You know why violin makes beautiful music? Because you have the chords and they're tightly wound. And therefore, the, it plays beautiful music. But imagine if the, the strands were loose and limp. Nothing would come out of it. When a person doesn't have a structure, a discipline, nothing magnificent, glorious, beautiful can come. There's rules to everything, every discipline. 
right? And that's what makes things magnificent, beautiful. Uh, uh, if a person wants to achieve greatness in any field, they have to follow a regiment, they have to follow protocols, they have to follow disciplines, they have to follow rules, laws. I'll just give you one other simple example. Imagine kids playing football on a rooftop of a 10-story building. There's a great football game going on, right? Now, there's a fence around the parameter of the rooftop where the kids are playing football, or adults. It doesn't have to be kids. Now, imagine a person say, well, why do we need these uh, inhibiting, uh, restrictive fences around the rooftop? Why not just have it have an open top roof without any fences around it or any walls around it, right? The answer is you wouldn't be able to enjoy a football game if there was no fences because you'd always be frightened that you're going to fall over the edge of the building and get killed. It's only because those fences are around the rooftop that you feel safe and secure running and playing worry-free without any fears. And the same thing is true in life. Think about children, right? Imagine parents raise kids without any structure, without any discipline. We want our kids to be free. You could do whatever you want. Eat when you want. Sleep when you want. Eat what you want. Eat wherever you want. Right? Do what you want. No, no rules in the, in the house. Right? No guidelines. No structure. Well, you're free. Kids, do whatever makes you happy. Right? Those kids will grow up the most not only unsuccessful kids, but unhappy kids. You say, what do you mean? Why are they unhappy? They should be so happy. I love my kids do whatever they want. I never punish them. I never discipline them. I never tell them these are the rules of the house. You cannot do this. You must do this. They could eat in their bedroom. They could eat in the, on the couch. They, they, they could take their cereal on the wherever they want. There's no rules. Because children, like adults, need to know they're safe and protected. And when there's no rules, then... There's no sense of security because anything that's important has to have rules. And love is actually communicated through rules. When there's no rules, if you really love me, you would give me guidelines. You would give me rules. You would give me law. If God doesn't love you, do whatever you want. I couldn't care less. Live out. If I love you, I tell you how I expect you to live, what I expect you to do. Marriage requires laws. Does it mean that when you get married, you lose your freedom because now there's a whole bunch of things you can't do that you were able to do when you were single? No, that's where you get your freedom because you could truly be yourself and express your deepest self to the person you're married that you can't do without it. Two people go on a business trip, one's single, one's married. They get off the flight, they check into their hotel, each one goes to their room. Well, the guy who's married... Okay, the minute he arrives, he has to call his wife. Today you text, but in those days, hi, honey, I arrived, I'm in my hotel room, right? The other guy, he's free, doesn't have to call anyone. He's a single guy, right? But the truth is, who's really free? The other guy, no one knows, no one cares if he arrives safely. This guy, his wife wants to make sure he arrives safely. So what may seem like it's a restriction is actually what gives you the truest freedom in life. And the same thing is with the Torah and Shavuot. And God says, yes, being a servant to another human being, serving another purpose, another person's personal benefits and gain, that's restrictive. But serving God, an infinite God who created you and knows what's best for you, right? That's serving God, but God what's, wants what's in your best interest. Just to throw out one last analogy and then we'll finish. You go to the doctor and he says, listen, you got to get healthy. Your, your cholesterol is high. You're, uh, you're overweight. You're obese. You're this, you're that. Your heart is not good. Here's a diet. You must eat this and not eat that. And you got to cut out alcohol and cigarettes and a whole bunch of other things, right? Now, two people go to the doctor, they get the same bill of health and the same guidelines. One person says, I don't want to be told what to do. I'm not going to have any restrictions in my life. I'll eat what I want to eat and do whatever habits I want to continue doing because I'm free. Well, their body is going to keep on mal malfunctioning, right? Why? Because you're going against your nature, how you were designed by God. God didn't design you to do these bad things eating and drinking or smoking habits. So you're hurting yourself. 
And you can't be free when you're doing something contrary to your own physical well-being. So what happens? You're going to continue to have health problems, God forbid, and other issues. So you're robbing yourself of your freedom. You may feel like, oh, I'm free. I can eat whatever I want. But you're not giving yourself freedom. The other person says, I'm going to take this very seriously. And he changes his diet and how he eats and how he exercises and how he lives. And, and within, God willing, some months, he's improving and he's having optimal health. And now he has energy and strength and uh, longevity, right? Yeah, he took upon himself all these restrictions but he gained real freedom because now his body is able to operate the way it's meant to operate and not be encumbered and restricted by the health challenges. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. God says, this is my Torah. This is the way to live a moral, ethical, happy, productive life. You may say, oh, I want to say Lush and Har. I want to say whatever I want about whoever I want. I don't want to restrict my, my words. I don't want to control my mouth. But you know who you're hurting? You're hurting yourself. When you speak gossip, you diminish yourself. You diminish you're, besides hurting the other person, you are also demeaning yourself, your own self-worth. When you have anger, when you have jealousy, it's not just that God wants you not to have jealousy. He's saying you'll be a happier person if you aren't jealous. You will be a happier person if you give people the benefit of the doubt. You will be a happier person if you forgive other people. You will be a happier person if you have a day of rest. Is Shabbat restrictive? Of course. There are things you can't do on Shabbat. You can't deny it. Person, One person could do it. It says, I don't keep Shabbat. I can do whatever I want. The other person has all these rules. I can't work. I can't do this. Right? But what you gain is the freedom of having a day of spiritual elevation, of connectivity with your family, of connection with God, with family. And when you leave Shabbat, you're a transformed person. And yes, you had to take steps that were seemingly restrictive but it's through those steps just like anything in life that if you want to gain you have to be willing to put in the time and the effort so that's the message of this week's Torah portion yes we're servants of God and we're happy and willfully servants of God and that's the highest accolade because we have a master God who only what's wants what's in our best interest so wishing everyone a beautiful day thank you all for joining and look forward to seeing you guys willing on shabbat if you're around all the best reminding everyone